Good morning, everybody. My name is Maggie Atwood, and I'm a member of the CHATS Committee. And we're delighted to have all of you here this morning. CHATS with Champions is sponsored by the First National Bank here in Damascata. This is a community bank chartered in the mid-1800s that now has grown to serve its customers in 16 locations along the main coast. <coughs> Our next Chats with Champions presentation after today will be on May 16th. We are very lucky to have two reporters from the Boston Globe coming, Jenna Russell and Scott Hellman, whose book on the Boston Marathon bombing has just been published. This presentation will be at 11 a.m. on the 16th, and it will be held in the Lincoln Theater. I'm sure it will be a fascinating presentation. At this time, I would like to request that everyone please silence their electronic devices. Today's presentation is entitled, Blue Lights and Funny Cider. John Ford Sr. is a retired Maine game warden, and Mark Nickerson is a retired state trooper. John comes from a long line of Maine game wardens, where he spent his 20-year career. After retiring in 1990, he was twice elected as Sheriff of Waldo County. He has written for local newspapers and is a regular contributor to the Northwood Sporting Journal. He is also known for his beautiful wildlife artwork, some of which is over there for sale. He has written two books, and there will be a third published this fall. These books will be for sale here after the presentation. Mark Nickerson originally studied to become a dentist, but the lure of police work called him, so he followed in the footsteps of his father, Millard E. Nickerson, who was the director of the Bureau of Criminal Investigations of the Maine State Police. Mark's career with the State Police continued for 28 years. He also has written columns about police work for The Citizen in Belfast and later in the Republican Journal. John's two books are entitled, Suddenly the T Cider didn't ta Doesn't Taste So Good, Didn't Taste So Good, and This Cider Still Tastes Funny. <laughs> Mark's book is entitled, Blue Lights in the Night, and each of these books has met with high praise, and John and Mark have agreed to sign the books after this presentation. So please welcome John and Mark. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. I got to tell you, it makes me nervous to be in here today because uh, John Atwood sitting over here on the side. Now, John was our district attorney of Waldo County way back when I was a baby game warden. Then later on, John actually was commissioner of public safety, so he was his boss. And, uh, we may have to have him leave a few times today. <laughs> so I've been told that I want to be on the straight and narrow, but I'm not going to bother with that because to hell with it. It's in time that that. I'd like to tell you, first of all, you know, I never, you folks could be hired up to come listen to two old cops telling stories, but uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about how I be decided to become a game warden and how Mac, he can tell his own story, how he became a trooper. And just to give you some idea of what, uh, what encouraged me to take the wildlife enforcement role, back when I was a young kid, I grew up in York County down in a little town called Shapley, which was now the Sanford. And I lived along the shores of Mousin Lake. And back in those days, uh, when I was a youngster, my grandfather had been the second police chief for the town of Sanford back in the 1920s. And uh, I wasn't around then, but I remember hearing the stories. But uh, he didn't like that job of being a police chief. The state police formed, and he became a main state trooper in 1929. And I want to tell you, back in those days, the troopers didn't have patrol vehicles that they patrolled in. They didn't have radios in their cruisers. So the only way that uh, when he went on patrol, he patrolled on a Harley Davidson motorcycle with a sidecar, or an Indian motorcycle with a sidecar. And uh, when they patrolled, when he patrolled out through Springvale and Shapley and out through Acton, uh, Lebanon, or Waterboro, whenever he was patrolling through a town, if he went by the post office, or if he went by a drugstore, or uh, some public place, if there was a red flag hanging off of the telephone pole, it meant that he had a complaint, that he had to go find a telephone, call the Wells Barracks, find out what the complaint was, go take care of that complaint, and then find the phone and call the barracks and tell them that he was all set. 
They didn't hear from him from an hour or so, then send another Halley out looking for him. And that was the way law enforcement was back in his days. As a youngster, I remember hearing some of the stories and the things that he did that uh, kind of lit a little fire that maybe later on in my life I'd like to take and go into a career as law enforcement. Now, my grandfather died when I was fairly young. My dad was a part-time deputy sheriff of the York County Sheriff's Department. So I got to see a side of that law enforcement. My mom and dad got divorced when I was fairly young. My mother married the game one. So I got to see the side of that law enforcement. And as if that wasn't bad enough, my mom was a wildlife rehabilitator. That meant that in our house, we didn't have cats and dogs roaming through the, uh, through the area, through the, the house all the time. We had critters like this. And this was Susie. Susie used to like to hang out in the wastebasket. And then uh, this was some of the other little ones that we had. But, you know, I, I was brought up in an environment where uh, we had bobcat. We had, uh, we had owls. We had bobcat. We had deer. We had a young moose. With, uh, we had a, I actually had a pet fisher that slept on my pillow with me when I was in high school. And it was one that we'd raised up. I gotta tell you, the, the best pet that I can remember, really remember, we had a pet skunk. And that skunk was named Molly. And uh, Molly was picked up, was well, probably about that big, its eyes had just been opened. And uh, Molly used to have the run of the house, wasn't descended, but she had the run of the house, and she used to stay underneath our couch. And one day the Avon lady came to the house. <laughs> and so the Avon lady had her, had her uh, new Avon lady, new to the area, she had a catalog spread out on the couch, and she and my mother are going through the catalog. And Molly came out from underneath the couch and began digging at her feet. Curious as to those new feet hanging there. And the lady thought it was a cat. And she, without looking, batted it upside the head and drove it back underneath the couch. So a few minutes later, Molly had enough of that, and she came back out and started digging again. That lady looked down, and when she saw that black silhouette with that white stripe on it, she, uh, she let a screech out of her, blew the wax right out of our ears. <laughs> Molly ducked underneath the couch, and I had to take her materials back out to the car, and we was put on the do not call list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it really it was fun. It was kind of fun growing up in a in an environment like that, but I made up my mind right off quick. When I was getting ready to go to high school, I wanted to be a game one. Come hell in the high water, that was what it was going to be. And so, I went to high school, probably was the worst student to ever walk into Sanford High School because I'd already made up my mind what I was going to do with my life. And what good was English, chemistry, algebra, by all, what the hell good was that going to do in making me become a good game one? Now I got to tell you, we had, uh, we had a chemistry teacher, he and I didn't actually hitch horses too well. And I was quite artistic at the time, and I was sitting in chemistry class, and uh, I was drawing a caricature drawing of my chemistry teacher, which wasn't a very pretty pose, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I got caught, and I had to go to the front of the class, and I had to show them what I was doing. And I opened up that book and showed the class that picture of my chemistry teacher, and that was my last day of chemistry. And uh, I was sent to the vice principal's office. We had a vice principal down there by the name of Ike Prescott. Ike Prescott was probably six foot eight, balding man. That man, all the time that we was in high school, we never saw him smile. And you couldn't get him to smile if you tickle his buns with a peacock feather. He just, he was one, we, all of us kids was intimidated by watching this man come around. Well, I'm sitting in his office, and he's getting ready to come in. I've been kicked out of chemistry and told not to come back. I really needed the credits to graduate from high school because I was not going to be valedictorian by any means. So I'm sitting in there thinking I'm in a big world of doo-doo. And he came in. And the first thing he says, what in the hell are you doing in here? And I said, I just got kicked out of chemistry and told not to report back to class. What'd you do? I says, I drew a picture of my teacher. He says, let me see it. He grabbed the book out of my hand. He opened up and he began laughing. And uh, I thought, oh God, I said, the old man's let a slip go here. He never laughed all the time I've been in. And he says, I'm going to tell you, that's pretty good. Uh, the replica of him, he says, but if you tell anybody I said that, I'll deny it, he said. <laughs> it actually was that artwork, that picture, that gave me an extra credit of art, which gave me enough credit to graduate. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I was out into the free world. By then, I still wanted to be a game one. Uh, you had to be 21 at that time. I was only 18, and, and I went to work in a small plastics factory in Champlain. I hated it. Uh, so I decided that I'm going to join the military, and I'm going to see the world and do it on their dime. That time, the Vietnam War was going, and uh, I was sent to block uh, to San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base, basic training. And I can remember getting off that plane at 5 o'clock in the morning thinking, what in hell have I ever done to myself? There was two instructors screaming in both ears and was telling us life as we knew it was over. And there was no question in my mind, it was. And so anyway, I went through the basic training. I was sent to uh, Tiesler Air Force Base to uh, learn to become a radar operator and, uh, in Mississippi. And so I was there. And while I was in Mississippi, the instructor said, if you had two places in the world to go, where would you want to go? I said, my first choice is I'd like to go now and be with my schoolmates and do my patriotic tour. My second place, I'd like to go to Alaska. And he says, what in the hell do you want to go to Alaska for? I said, the long day game was someday. What better place to go than Alaska, where they got all this game and fish, and it, it's really a well-known area. Well, he says, I wouldn't get my Air Force Packer out. Where you going? You probably aren't going to need it, meaning that I probably going to be going down. My mother was home having a fit, and I can remember when my orders came. I called home, and, and uh, she says, where are you going? And I said, you got a main map. And she says, what do I need main map for? And I said, where in hell is Topsom, Maine? <laughs> uh, i got to tell you, I joined the Air Force to see the world. During the time of war, I went to Texas and Mississippi, and I was stationed 60 miles from home. Now, uh, i got to tell you, I think that was God's way of putting me in the right place at the right time. Because while I was at Topsom, I was able to take the written waters exam, even though I wasn't 21. And I passed it somehow, and uh, I didn't have to draw a picture of a coon or anything to get in there, but I passed that test. They did an investigation on me. I was actually on an eligibility list. If an opening came up, I could be considered, but I had to wait until I was 21. And that list would be good for five or six years. So what was the chances of my coming back to Maine, being able to take that and fulfilling that dream? So I was at Thompson for three years, knowing that I had at least got my foot somewhat in the door of being a game one. They finally decided they were going to close the base, and I said, I'm finally going to get out of Maine. My orders came. It was for a place called Charleston Hill, not the Bangor. So I joined the Air Force to see the world. I spent all four years, less than 150 miles long. I got $2.25 in travel pay when I got this So. But again, I had done it. Uh, things were starting to work out pretty good, and uh, that goal of becoming a game one was a, the biggest thing that I wanted to do. When I got discharged in July of 1970, I went back to Sanford. I worked for a little department store, maybe many of you can remember, W.T. Grants. Yes. And I worked for W.T. Grants for $2 and a quarter an hour, and I hated it. So it was in September that. Uh, notice came down that I was being called to Augusta for a job interview. So that's where I'm going to leave you because if I don't let him talk, he's going to cry all the way home. So that's how I uh, work my way up to becoming a game one. We got two minutes. the last two minutes for me, so I'm really shocked at this. But the funny thing I'd like to mention is that here we are in 2015, and John mentioned about his grandparents uh, and his, his grandfather being the trooper in that area, Sanford, Maine, uh, in 1929. The funny part about it is that my grandparents lived eight houses down the street from John's grandparents, and they were good friends. And my dad told me all, you know, throughout my life, how his grandfather actually mentored my dad and encouraged him to become a state trooper. And, but I got to tell you that as much as my father thought of Lee Ford, um, the Ford name had a lot more respect back then than it does today. Trust me. <laughs> he wanted to enjoy that because he got paid on it a little later. <laughs> well, my dad became a trooper in uh, 1953, and he was stationed in the Bassinger area. And at that time, a lot of the original troopers, our department was formed in 1925, 
a lot of the originals had just retired or were getting ready to retire. And in 55, my dad became one of the original detectives for the Maine State Police. And he was good friends with a lot of these original members. And there were people like uh, Merrill Cole or Lloyd Hoxie. But one of the probably most famous Maine State Troopers ever was was a fellow by the name of Eddie Marks. Eddie Marks came on in 1925 as an original trooper with his twin brother, Charlie. And he served 50 years with the Maine State Police, retiring in 1975. Now, Eddie Marks, to describe him, he's probably a man about my size. He had a completely bald head. He always had a wet, unlit cigar sticking out of his mouth that used to disgust my mother beyond belief. But every couple of months, my dad used to have a little, they call it choir practice, but it was a little friendly game of cards at the house. And these gentlemen would show up at our home. And Eddie Marks loved children. And he used to come early to tell us stories about his escapades as a young trooper. Now, Eddie Marks had a 375-pound pet black bear named Minnie that he used to dress up with a little reporter's cap on it and a scarf around it, and he would put it, he would chain it to the inside of the sidecar on the motorcycle and go on patrol. <laughs> so, can you imagine people's reaction as this big bad state trooper is driving through town on a, on a Harley Davidson with a black bear riding on the sidecar with him? <laughs> so, one of the stories I remember him telling, though, was one day he's on patrol with Minnie the Bear, and he comes to a railroad crossing, and the train is going by, the gate is down, and so Eddie stops the bike and gets off it and stretching his legs and waiting for the train to go by. Well, the train blew its whistle and spooked the bear. The bear jumps out of the sidecar and is dragging his motorcycle down across the field. And here's Eddie with his cigar sticking up hoofing out, trying to check, catch his motorcycle. <laughs> now, as a little boy, I'm thinking, that's what I want to do right there. <laughs> Just like this guy. So I told my dad over the years, I mean, I, my dad, I always felt he had a very important position, and I wanted to be a trooper like him. And, and I told him that, and he says, no, 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 no. Duty for them was 24 hours a day. It was seven days on, one day off a week. And I rarely saw my dad growing up. And, uh, but I told him what my wishes were, and he said, no, no, no. And he says, I've got a dentist friend in Augusta, and uh, he's going to be looking for somebody about your age, you know, you get a degree, and become a dentist, and uh, you can go to work in his practice. And then you become a partner, and then he'd retire, and you could take it over. And I thought about that for a little while, and I thought, well, yeah, they make pretty good money. I guess I could do something like that. So I was uh, enrolled in the pre-med program at University of Maine in Orono. And uh, one of the classes was zoology. And I, I wasn't in that class for months. And the professor had us in this back room. And there was this tank. And he had his students go around this tank. And he pulled the cover off. And there's this guy soaking in formaldehyde in it. And he says, we're going to dissect this fellow. And I said, you guys can dissect him. Come on here. And I promptly went back to my dorm room. And I called my dad. And he says, would you want me to or not, Dad? I'm going to be a trooper. And from that point forward, he supported me. And I got my degree in criminal justice and became a trooper in 1977, stationed in Moosehead Lake. Mm -hmm. so that's where I stopped. So, back to you. <laughs> I got to tell you, if you notice, the Max Department formed in 1925, and the Warden Service formed in 1880. And I got to figure it out. The only reason that the state police ever formed is because. They all wanted to be game ones, but they couldn't hack the program. <laughs> I mean, you start and figure any damn fool right around with a bear beside him, obviously wanted to be a game one. <laughs> you know, it, it's amazing how things really came about. But you know, again, look at the look at the uh, the way things happen. What's the chances of my getting in the right place to to be hired? And Mac and I patrolling together with a relationship from my family. Maybe it was meant to be, but. 1970, as I was working in grants, my stepfather came in and he said, look, he said, don't be called into Augusta for a couple of job openings. And he said, don't think you're going to get hired the first time you go up there because, uh, you know, they want to see if you're really serious about it if you come back a couple of times and, and really pursue the job enthusiastically. So I went to Augusta thinking that probably I wouldn't get hired the very first time. And I went to, at that time, the, uh, the water service was on the sixth floor of the state office building. I took the elevator and went up. 
And I met the chief one, the deputy chief one at that time, was a fellow by the name of Jack Shaw. Now, Jack Shaw, the minute I saw him, he reminded me of Mike Prescott, that mean old guy and my, my principal in school. And so I had that, that fear right off quick. Jack took me into his office, which was a small, dingy little office, no windows. He sat down behind the desk, and he winked at me. And the very first question he asked me, he said, are you single? And that scared the hell right out of me. <laughs> well, I was looking, where's the exit sign? Where's this going? And uh, I said, yes, sir, I am. That's good. He said, we're looking for a single man for a district that we have. Well, that made me feel a little better. And uh, he says, we have two districts that are open. He says, one is for a little town in Maine called Daquan. Anybody in here know where Daquan, Maine is? <laughs> ah, another. You do. We got one. The only way you can get to Daquan is you have to go into Canada, and there's a dirt road that comes down along the side of the, uh, the main state line, and way out in the pocket brush is this little community they call Daquan, where there's 13 people that live there about year-round. And you know, if I was to get assigned to that area, that was going to look a lot like my Air Force career. I wasn't doing it. <laughs> so he looked at me and he said, now I know a young fellow like you, single, sat now, you wouldn't want to go to an area like that. But the next district we have is uh, the northern part of Waldo County, the Burnham District. And he says, but I want to be honest with you, they hate game wardens in that Burnham District. <laughs> to show you how much they hate them, he said, three weeks ago, the young warden and his wife and young daughter was living in a state camp on the lower road in Burnham. And he was out working at night when some of these thugs showed up and they shot every window out of the house with his wife and daughter laying on the floor. And they were sure they was going to die. So they want to transfer out of the area. We put the area out for bed, and there's no one that wants to move down there for some reason. And uh, he says, so we're looking for a single man wanting to make a new start. And he says, uh, would that by any chance be you? My God, I thought I'd won Powerball. I said, uh, do you mean I've got the job? And he said, well, damn it, you want it, don't you? And I says, yes, sir. And he says, when can you start? And I says, how about tomorrow morning? And he says, how about you give WP Grants two-week notice and uh, report back here, and, and uh, then we'll sway you in. Now, i got to tell you, things was a lot different in law enforcement in those days because needle nuts here didn't come on until 1977. I came on in 1970. And when I came on, I... What? When I came on, they pinned the badge on me that very day. They gave me a little 38 revolver, an old beat up cruiser, an aluminum summons book, and they turned me loose on the public. Day one. Day one. Oh, shit. I'm the job training. Now, I got to tell you, they, they took me out and showed me the district line. I had 14 towns that I was responsible for. And they made it very clear that game wardens was not popular in that area. I got to tell you, it's probably the prime deer hunting in the state of Maine was at Northern Waldo County at that time. And during that time, they actually had a gang that was, uh, was professional poachers. What they would do is you could buy fresh deer meat any time of the year. All you had to do was call these people up, order what you want, and then wrap it and pack it, and you'd just come down and pick it up. Anytime you wanted. Now the deer season at that particular time started the 4th of July when the bees came up and it didn't end until the second blizzard hit sometime in December. And these people were so organized that what they did is they'd get together and have a deer roast and about the 4th of July, they'd pool their money so that if anybody got caught breaking a fish and game rule that was really expensive, it wouldn't come from that individual's pocket, it came from the slush fund that they created. So they was quite organized, and they knew what they was doing. So when I drove into Burnham the first time, and I went to gas my cruiser up, it was like the black plague that drove into the Zoya. Everybody ran into the store, hid behind the bread counter, and couldn't wait for me to get the hell out of the Zoya. And I thought, this is going to be an interesting 20 years, and uh, <laughs> just to give you some example, Norman Gilbert was the one that I worked with in 1970, and Norman said, we had uh, CB radios in our cars, you know, the ones that truckers used uh, to keep contact. And Norman said, when we worked night hunters that first night, he said, turn your CB on. Now, mind you, it's 10 o'clock at night. And I said, Norman, what am I going to hear on that tonight? And he said, just turn it on. 
So I turned it on, I pulled out of my door yet, I went up to the end of the road where there's a four-way intersection, a little store called Patterson Store. The minute I turned right, I heard breaker breaker on one night. Red coat just took a right at the store. <laughs> now, the red coat was the red jacket that we wore in the fall. Oh, you gotta be kidding. And someone comes on the mic and they said, break a break one night. I'll watch the other end, let you know which way it goes. So I get to the other end of the road and I take a left and I hit break a break one night. He just took a left. He's headed towards the village. Someone says, I'll watch down there. So I pick up the mic and I say, break a break one night. He just took a left at the village. He's headed towards Benton. Boys come over the radio and said, the hell he did, that you, and you get off that radio. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is really going to be an interesting career. So, it, uh, it really just, it just proved that the things were so much different. In 1970, when I moved to that area, you didn't have the welfare programs that you've got today. So a lot of those people were farmers with large families, who there was no question. They'd go up behind the barn in the middle of the night, there was a deer in the garden, they'd shoot it, drag it in, and it was a matter of survival for those families. That was a way of life, and we knew that. So, but you had that organized group that was uh, the ones that we really wanted to concentrate on. So, you had to use discretion back then. I can remember the very first division meeting that we had, that uh, it was at the Dover Waters camp with a bunch of the old ones. I was the only new baby in the month. The chief warden was there and he said, gentlemen, I've got some real bad news for you. And you know, the chief warden had never showed up at about, about like the, the uh, state police commission. They never showed up at a meeting unless they had bad news. And so anyway, <laughs> chief warden shows up and he says, uh, you know, I got some real bad news for you. The guys all, oh, they knew something was coming. Uh, he said the, the, the Supreme Court, federal Supreme Court has ruled that that from this point on, if you're going to take anybody into custody, or if you're going to question them or accuse them of crime, you have to read them their rights. And that was when the Miranda rights came into being. You have the absolute right to make silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. And that, the one you see on the cop program. Some of them old time ones have been on for years. They were throwing their books and swearing and cussing and. And two of them said, you know, that's it. To hell with this. Now we've got to tell these damn fools who can't talk to them, they've got to shut up. He says, it's time for me to move on. This world's gone to hell. And they quit. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm a new guy on the block. I guess I ought to be able to read off the cat. And I accepted that. And then there's a, the, the issues of search warrants. This is where John comes into it. That uh, the DAs always used to take and give us fits about that. When we did search warrants back then, we always took three ones, and you went to the house that you wanted to search, and two of the ones walked behind the house, and when that guy knocked on the front door, them guys up back would holler, come in! And that was the way we did our search. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear him say it right now. You tell me you didn't do that in my county. I'm not going to tell you we didn't do that in my county. <laughs> He wasn't my boss when this happened, okay? <laughs> but when I went to the academy, the academy used to tell us, if you guys going to do a you know, quick search or whatever, go see a warden because they have all these magical search powers. <laughs> okay, so I was working this big case up in Greenville, a lot of stolen property. And uh, I got a tip that some of it was stored in the camp way up on Ross Lake, middle of the winter. So the chief pilot of the warden service says, oh, I'll fly you up there. So he and another warden and myself, we fly up on Ross Lake and land on the lake and taxi up, we find the camp we're looking for. And, and uh, now there's nobody within 50 miles of where we're at. There's two or three feet of snow on the ground, any chimney, there's no smoke coming out of, no plowed roads. And uh, we get out of the plane and one of the wardens walked out back to the camp. And the other one that walked up on the front porch and he bangs on the door and I heard this, come in. <laughs> Did you hear that? And I said, there's, there's nobody here. <laughs> we were in the camp and uh, I got all the stolen property back, and, uh, but I never dared to charge anybody because I knew I was going to lose it in court, but first you get the property back and somebody skated, so. <laughs> Honest, you weren't my boss back then. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, you heard him say that uh, the academy told him. The academy told him that if they wanted to do a search, to get a warden. 
You know, well, if the academy and if the state police thought it, look, why the hell did you go with them that day? I mean, you know, so I'm always telling I had to teach him things all through his career. You know, that, uh, there's different things that, uh, you know, the academy didn't teach him. It took a game one to really keep him out and keep him safe. And I was that one that did it in my it, uh, You know, one of the things was working night hunters. Now, there was a field in, in Albion. Uh, another one and I was working in a nice green field where been a lot of night hunting activity and we decided to work it at 1.30 in the morning. And when, as we packed our car and get outside, we could hear across the road, we could hear coon dog down in a cornfield, way down off the, the side of the road from where we're at. And we heard them hunting the coon, they treated it, and they heard the pop pop and probably shot the coon. I said to the warden I was with, I said, when they come up out of there, I said, uh, we ought to hide the ditch and jump them and open uh, just to make sure that they're all legal, that they got their licenses and stuff, and let them know that their game wardens are working at 2.30 in the morning. He thought it was a pretty good idea. So we went over, we got in the ditch. You see the lights of that truck coming up through the woods, you know, and you have to kind of go, because you never know from one minute to the next what's going to happen. When we jumped up to stop that vehicle, there was a guy standing in the back of the pickup truck with a loaded 30 yard six over the cab roof of that, hoping to see a deer in that field. Now that wasn't coon hunting, that was night hunting. And when he saw us, he bolted out of that truck, and I was behind him like a coon dog, chasing him out across that field. All our cars were stopped, and we got into the woods, and he's running and running. And I got my light right on the back of his head, and I'm saying, my God, how can he keep doing that? Then I came too. He's using my light to see where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I did? I shut the light out and I heard smack. And I got out there and he's laying on the brush pile, the rifle's over there, so I unload the rifle and I sat on the stump till he comes to. I come dragging him back to the car and, and uh, you know, we convicted him and his buddies of night on. So Dick Rachel, who happens to be another trooper in my area before Matt showed up, came to my house one night and he says, John, he says, uh, I've got, a, uh, I've got an arrest warrant for a guy living in a camper up in Jackson. He's been committed quite a few crimes. Any chance I can get you to go with me and sneak out behind his camper. And when I knock on the door, I know he's going to run. He's, and so we want to be ready. And I said, sure. I love sneaking around in the dark. So I went out and snuck in behind the camper and, and signaled him I was all set to go. And he found it on the door. And when he did, that guy came out of there. And away we went, down across the packing lot and down into the woods. And Dick was in front of me, and he shut the light on the back of his head. And I said, Dick, shut your light up, shut your light up. So he finally did, and we had smacked the splash. We found the guy in the front. Down. We actually saved his life. He would have drowned if we hadn't pulled him out of there. And so we get almost back to the campsite, and Dick says, uh, i got a problem. And I said, so don't I. I said, I lost my portable radio running down through the woods. Dick says, well, I've lost my gun. Now, he says, what are we going to do with this guy? And I said, well, handcuff him to that pine tree over there. He ain't going to pull that up by the road. So this guy didn't know what we were doing. We took him over and handcuffed him to the pine tree and went out looking for our stuff. All you could hear was, hey, hey, you guys can't leave me like this. So, we went back. We finally found our stuff. But did the academy teach him that? So, I, I really hate to admit this. I hate to have you. <laughs> one night I get in the chase going across Route 3 down in Sears Lot, and, uh, and the guy goes off the road and I'm right behind him and we tear up this person's lawn and, and he jumps out and down through the woods we go. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I was almost within reach of grabbing him, but I couldn't quite grab him and I had my flashlight right on the back of his head. And I was starting to get winded and I'm thinking, you know, there's this really old game one that told me about turning off this flashlight. And I did, and it was textbook. As soon as I shut it up, you heard the big old snap. And, and I stopped turning the light on, and he's out cold right on the ground with a big bloody gash. And I sat down on the stump to, you know, catch my breath before I would come out. But after that, it was all easy. You want to tell them how we got going? Yeah, that's like, I, I like that this part. This is, John and I, we, we have books out now, but what, what the, how we got started is really kind of interesting. Um, John obviously was the warden in the area of well, Baldwin County. I represented state police in that area, and we had another friend by the name of Jonesy that was worked for the Sheriff's Department, and the three of us. We hung around together a lot, and we used to meet anywhere and everywhere, share information. We solved a lot of the crime.
crime up in that area. And we would meet anywhere, uh, parking lots or restaurants and, yes, donut shops. <laughs> when my, when my, I had my, my son was probably three or four years old one time, and we're driving through the town of Winslow, and they were building a brand new Dunkin' Donuts. And my little boy, he comes up, he goes, look, Daddy, they're building you a new office. <laughs> So, um, in 1990, John decided that he was going to retire from the warden service and run for the high sheriff of Waldo County, and he got elected. And we're still recounting the ballots because no one could believe that John would get elected. <laughs> but now he's got an office down in Belfast that we could go to and hang out and put our feet up and tell really good stories. And there was this lady by the name of Beth Staples, and she was the editor of the local paper. And she used to come up and do the police beat story up at the sheriff's department. And she used to sit in on some of our bull sessions, and she loved the stories. And, and after hearing them so many times, she says, you know, John, she goes, you want to write these on paper, and I'll give you a column in the newspaper and share them with the public. And John, he hemmed and hawed, and he goes, he's I, I don't know. I, I don't think that's a good idea to share these with the public. And, she goes, well, you know, we'll pay you $50 a story. He goes, I'm in. <laughs> John's writing career got started as, he's, as he is high sheriff of Wallow County. Now, I'm still an active trooper out on the, out on the road and patrolling and so forth. And no matter where I went, people would say to me, oh, we read John's column this week, and uh, we kept the behind-the-scenes story and what you did and so forth. And John was always throwing insults at me. And, and I was always defending myself with the public, so one day Beth calls me after a couple of years and she says, you know, John's always insulting you in these stories. She goes, do you have a story about him? And I said, how many do you want? <laughs> she goes, well, why don't you write one and let's see what happens. I go, geez, Beth, I, I'm still an active trooper and I'm sure the administration of the department would uh, not appreciate any of my stuff. She goes, well, write one anyway and, and I'll edit it and make sure nobody gets sued and let's see what happens. <laughs> So I thought, you know, what are they going to do with me? Make me a trooper and put me in unity? So I said, sure. <laughs> so I wrote a story. And the first story went like this. As usual, I was John's chauffeur anyway. I couldn't get him out of my cruiser. And uh, we were working late one night. And we started getting these complaints. And there was this, people were calling in about a suspicious vehicle and a person that was pulling into their door yards. And the driver would get out and he'd knock on their door or ring the doorbell. And then he'd get back in his vehicle and take off and do it to the next house. So several people had called in. So we headed into the area and I had just crossed Route 3 and headed down 220. And the very first vehicle we met matched the description of what we were looking for. So I did a flip around and did a traffic stop on this vehicle and approached the driver and he was a middle-aged gentleman. Um, Looked like he'd been out on a fishing boat, and this was his first day back, and he'd been bending his elbow an awful lot that day. And uh, so I had him out of the vehicle. Um, he had produced his driver's license, and his name was Earl. And Earl was from Waldenburg. And I said, Earl, I'm going to have to have you have a seat up in my cruise, and we're going to have to go through an OUI. He says, my name is not Earl, it's Oil. He says, you call me Oil, or you call me nothing at all. And I says, Okay, well, you're still going to have to have a seat up for my cruiser. It's okay. Now, he was in a good mood. He was just drunk and lost. <laughs> so he comes up and he has a seat in the front seat of my cruiser. I'm behind the wheel. And John has a seat behind Oil in the back seat. And as I'm making out the paperwork, I have to tell you, that particular night I was dying from a cold and I had some bits between the seats. And as I'm making out the paperwork, Oil says to me, he says, can I borrow your bits? Well, I couldn't imagine why he'd want to borrow my picks, but I said, sure, I have at it. So as I'm writing this, I kind of watch him, and he picks up the picks, and he takes the cover off, and he gets a great big blob of picks on his hand, and reaches over, and he smeared it on my uniform from my knee to my shoulder. And I'm looking at oil, and he's got a big smirk on his face. Nothing but what I had. <laughs> Look, that's an assault. <coughs> and when I landed on oil on the passenger seat, the seat breaks and we land in John's lap in the back seat. And oil's glasses go flying off and he goes, I give up. 
And I says, but oil, I says, you're being uncooperative now and I have to take you to jail. And I hated taking people to jail because it was just more paperwork. <laughs> so we get oil handcuffed and back up this and straighten out the seat and see it melted in and we're on our way to jail down in Belfast. And we go a couple, three miles and he says, uh, he says, I need my glasses. I can't see without them. And John pipes up from the back seat. He says, got them right here. So John produces the glasses and I reach over and I put them on a roll's face. And we go another couple, three miles and Oil says, uh, he says, I think you hurt me. And I says, I, I didn't hurt you. He goes, no. He goes, my eyesight's all blurry. He says, I can't see a thing. <laughs> and I says, you'll be fine. I didn't hurt you. And we go another two or three miles and he goes, no, he says, you hurt me. He goes, my eyesight's all blurry. Well, now I'm getting kind of concerned that maybe I did hurt him. Because John's in the back seat chuckling about the whole thing. I said, we'll take care of it when we get down to the jail. So we show up at the jail, and I help him out of the cruiser. And I open up the entrance to the door to the jail, and oil walks right into the door frame. And at this point, I'm really concerned that I might have hurt him. And we go inside, and he walks into a wall, because John's still laughing. <laughs> and uh, so I turned oil over the jail personnel, and I finally turned to none nuts here, and I said, why is so funny? And he goes, huh? Because I smeared dicks all over his glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll think the Academy taught him how to do that? <laughs> we never did tell oil what we did during that night. And, uh, but the very first email that came out was from the colonel of the state police who said, please tell me you don't have any more of these stories. <laughs> and uh, so I waited until I retired, which was just a, you know, a month or so. And that's how the writing gets started. Beth gave me one, one week, John had the other week, and we would spar back and forth for seven or eight years we did that. We had, we had fun doing it, and the people really liked it. So that's how it gets started. Who's commissioner back there, do it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it really is, it's been a lot of fun doing the stories that uh, when I went up into Burnham, my stepfather told me, he says, look, he says, keep a diary. Keep a diary of those things that you really enjoyed the most because he says, someday you may want to write a book. Now, if my English teacher today was still alive and she knew that I would have written two books and written a third, that would have killed her on the spot because I just couldn't stand to do English or any of that. But I gotta tell you something, those, those notes that I kept from day one are the most valuable things that I've ever done because as I wrote that book, I felt like I was reliving that career all over again. And the things that I tried to write about wasn't the politics of the department, the tragedies that we had to investigate, I wanted the funny things. And I did some stupid things myself. Now I'll tell you, one of them was, when I first got into that area, trying to learn north through south, east and west, trying to learn all these towns, people inside, the roads that went back and forth, I finally got that down well. Matter of fact, that first night I tried doing it on my own. I drove and drove and drove, and I finally saw a sign that said Holton three miles. So I didn't know if I was going to find unity again. But I finally got that down pat, and and uh, you know, and and I really got so that I knew the roads, of people, and the houses, and everything. And Dick Vanny, who happened to be one of our welcome pilots, called me up one day, and he said, "John, he says uh, I'm going to have to fly that district of yours, and I've never done it before." to know, in case I get an emergency, can I pick you up in the department plane on Unity Pond and uh, we'll fly it and learn it together. Now, I didn't get to fly when I was in the Air Force, but this water service was pretty good. That plane came shooting over the treetops, landed out the lake, taxied up the shore, I climbed up in there, took my hat off, put the seat belt on, we spread out the topographical map, and away we went, out across the pond and up to about 2,000 feet. We began circling. Dick says, where are we? I says, I don't have a clue. And I gotta tell you, if any of you have been in a small plane or a balloon, and you're flying along, and you look down, and, and all of a sudden, to say exactly where you are, it's hard to tell. Yeah. So we began dropping down, and we were circling, and I'd see a chicken house, or I'd see a road, or a house that I'd recognize, and, and I'd say, oh yeah, we're in Dixmont, or we're in Troy, or we're in Burnham, or Unity, or Montville, or, and then we'd go back up, and this was fun for about an hour. And then all of a sudden, you know, the drone of that engine, no heat, no air coming in there, and I wasn't looking down anymore, and I wasn't talking a lot, 
I'm kind of looking for that bag that's behind the seat, and there wasn't one, but Dick's hat was there if I needed something. And we was just coming over here to respond, and Dick, being a, an experienced pilot, recognized what was going on. He said, John, there's a couple of people fishing in the canoe down there. If you want to land, get a breath of fresh air, and then if you want to go back up, we can. And I said, sure, boy. That sound, breath of fresh air, sounded good. So we came down, and that plane hit the water, and uh, you know, the pontoon slapped again. We slowed down to a small crawl, and we're taxiing towards these two ladies in the canoe, further end of Unity Pond, fishing in a secluded cove all by themselves. And their eyes are getting bigger and bigger as this plane slowly coming at them. We got almost to them, and Dick said when we get closer, he said, jump down on the pontoon, check their licenses, and uh, then if you want to go back up, we will. So we folded up the map, I unhooked the seat belt, put my hat on, polished my badge, straightened up my gun, jumped out of the plane, and missed the pontoon. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sitting in about 10 feet of water on the bottom of the Unity Pond in amongst the weeds, looking up at the float of the plane, my hat floating along, and two fishing moves bobbing by my head in the bottom of that canoe. And I thought, this is going to be highly embarrassing. Maybe I ought to just let the air out right now, and I can see the Waterville Sentinel in the morning and would say, Game Warden dies checking fishing license on him. <laughs> but that wasn't the right thing. Mother Nature makes you survival. I came back up, grabbed my hat. The lady in the back of that canoe, her legs were going around. I knew she'd go wet herself. She was right in right there. Woman in front, God bless her, was pinching her lips, just staring at me. Dick was in the plane. He couldn't even stand at the entry. He was right there nice staring. I crawled up onto that, grabbed my hat, the water was running out of my holster. And I looked at Dick and I said, well, I think they're all legal. I didn't see any string of illegal fish underneath the <laughs> <laughs> thing I could have said. I thought, you know, if you're going to write a book, you might as well tell people of some of your own mistakes. So, that was one of them. Another one that I did was uh, in the spring of the year, we had a dead deer that got caught on the ice, something killed it, big buck deer on the Spatscook River that flowed between Burnham Village and, and Clinton. Now, the ice had melted, that deer washed downstream, and it washed up onto a guy's lawn, just outside of the town of Clinton. Brand new house, beautiful lawn, and it was our job to remove things like that. I had to go over there. They didn't give us trucks at that time. We had a regular sedan. I was supposed to haul that stinking deer up across the lawn, throw it in my trunk, and probably smell it for the rest of the summer. Now, no one was home when I got there. And I thought, well, I can throw it back into the river and hope the current will take it downstream. But Clinton was just a little ways away, and I knew what would happen. It would wash up in Clinton Village. Everybody in town would watch me try to pull the foolish thing out. But I came to the idea, we had to think on our feet. And I had some dynamite in the past, because we used the dynamite paper dams. And I had a, a couple of sticks of dynamite in there, and I said, no one's home here. And I think if I put one stick of dynamite in that deer's chest cavity, get him back into the current, feed my wire, and let him float downstream, he'll become fish feed down below us. So I did. I ran up, and I got the stick of dynamite to cap, and I ran back, and I took a deep breath, sliced the deer open, shoved the dynamite in the cap in there, pulled the deer back out, got him into the current, Instead of going downstream like the damn thing should have, got caught in an eddy. They kept going around <laughs> and coming that guy's house. And no one was home. And I said, I, if I jumped in trying to pull that deer up, I'd have been in Benton before that deer ever got to Clinton. So I had no choice but to detonate it. And I did. And just as I did, there was this god awful boom. The water in, in the sky was filled with chunks of meat, legs, and you name it. And instead of coming down into the water like it should have, it well went all over Freddie's lawn. <laughs> Just as Freddy drove into the door yet. Uh, he came around that corner that day and he was calling me names I'd never heard before, some I've never heard since. I knew I was going to be insulted and probably fired. And, uh, but I ended up with his rake and his wheelbarrow and I hauled the old Bucky off up the road and dumped him there. So I spent the whole day. Freddy never called me again, never sent me a Christmas card or anything. And, uh, you know, and I was fortunate I never heard from the main office. So when I wrote the book, I thought, God, the bosses are going to look at that and say, what kind of an idiot did we hire? So when I wrote the book, Russ Dyer, who happened to be one of our chief wardens many years later, called me up and he said, John, he says, i got to tell you something. He says, I read that story about you blowing up that deer with a dynamite. 
He says, I'm going to tell you my story. He says, when I was a warden, I had a big moose floating in Tobago Lake, and I put six sticks on it. <laughs> he said, I know there's no antlers hanging from the tree. So his wife said, fought like. I mean, we didn't make that You know, and you're, the stories you can tell forever. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. This is my favorite warden story of all. Why don't you tell one of you what she said? She's having us off, and, and we, we have to get this one story. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, the, the Walter? Oh, my. Yeah. The Wicked Witch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Way back when we wardens, we used to have our, uh, our cars we used to be equipped with switches so we could cut out our brake lights and drive in what we call the stealth mode. Now, when you work at night hunters, people say, why would you want to do that? When you work in night hunters, you need three elements of the crime. You needed to have the overt act of them looking for a deal with a light. You had to have the light, and you had to have a gun and ammunition. So that uh, in order to do that, I mean, obviously, if you're sitting in the field somewhere, and these guys come back and light the field, and all of a sudden they see headlights come on from the back of the field, they're going to say, there's a damn game one. Take off in a high speed and stuff would go out the window, and you'd never prove your case. So we was authorized to have switches in that cast and break, cut out the brake lights and stuff. Now, Homer Edgecombe and Walter, uh, God, I can't remember his name now. Oh, yeah, Walter, anyway. Well, they was working the, the blueberry barrens down in Washington County. Now, someone was here from Washington County, might be like, hook on to them. They was uh, a poacher down there that uh, his game, he found out that if he kept driving up to the across those barrens with the headlights of the car, that eventually he'd pick up a deer in those headlights. He could swing the car around, shoot the deer, throw it into the trunk, and go. And he was bragging about how many deer he got this way. So Homer and Walter decided what they was going to do was put an effort on. They were going to catch him, make an example of it that they was they was working it. So they packed by the edge of the barrens. Sure enough, two o'clock in the morning, the cow they're looking for comes slowly crawling up by him. Went up over the rise and heading out across the blueberry barrens. So Walter was driving, and he gets out, Walter Bishop, and he gets out, and he drives, he's trying to catch up with them. Well, he comes up over the rise, and what he didn't know was the car had stopped, so Henry could get out and take a leap. So Henry's out there doing his thing, you know, and all of a sudden this car comes out of the black, smacks the other one right in the rear end, and ships it down across the blueberry barrens, and then can push it. Now, they, uh, Homer hit his head on the windshield, didn't hurt him too bad. Poor Henry standing there doing his thing, watching everything happen around him. And so uh, Homer gets out, runs down to make sure the guy's all right in the car. When he gets down there, the guy knew him real well, and he opens, puts his light in and, and makes sure he's all right. The guy rolls the window down, and he says, Jesus, Homer, am I glad to see you? He says, Henry, you got to out, oh, take a leap, the cow blew up. <laughs> That cost him five or ten thousand dollars in the civil suit later on. And they were told to be a little more cautious driving without a <laughs> You know, the thing is, we got the stories around us. We could sit here all day and tell them. And uh, it's been a great time. I think that people need to laugh, today's world especially. Uh, we'd like to open up. Anybody got any questions or any comments or things that. I want to know what was actually in Topson when you were sent there as a. It was a uh, small radar base, oh, okay. just up above. Uh, it's now, I think, the uh, the Navy had taken it over. But uh, are you familiar with Thompson? Not, not really. But not really. Yeah, it, it was a small. I think it was actually shared between the uh, Canadian military air force and and the American air force, and uh, uh, it was a small base. We really was. A, it was like Boy Scout camp. Was yeah. Brunswick a base then? Brunswick Air Base was was over in Brunswick, okay. but. Our job was, is what there was a NORAD defense that we monitored all of the air traffic coming across the country. So there's what they call the Nadia's line. It goes down around the, the whole eastern seaboard. The minute one of these planes coming from overseas crossed that line, we had two minutes to identify who it was. If we couldn't, then we'd scramble jets to go up and, and find out. And it was an amazing job. We'd actually scramble jets on a flock of geese one time. I was always wondering what those geese were. They were flying high, but I mean, they were picked up on radar. And you, can you imagine a, a flock of geese in their formation having an F-16 come up the side? I'll be sucked them all the way south. <laughs> You know, it, it was a small base, and, uh, and same with uh, actually in Charleston. 
Uh, and it, it's funny because that base up in Charleston, when I got elected to sheriff, I gotta tell you the sheriff story. I mean, when I decided to run for sheriff, uh, I knew my time had come with the warden service and time to move on. So Stan Knox, the sheriff who was in the area at the time, uh, was going to retire, and I thought, well, that'd be a pretty good job to go. And uh, so when I ran, it was a public office, and I got a letter from one of them poachers that I got up in Burnham time and time again. And that guy had sent me a personal check for $200 that said, John, please use this money towards your campaign. We hope to have you get elected because then we'll know where the hell you are. Okay? <laughs> This guy in court, he was in court probably more than most judges. I mean, <laughs> and he had to send me 200 bucks of his own money. It was really kind of a, a rewarding thing. And then I got thinking, you know, he didn't do that. That money came from that damn slush fund. <laughs> <laughs> so, the way politics go. Did you cash the check? Yeah, and it didn't bounce. <laughs> I, was, I was quick to go to the bank for that. <laughs> happened to that Indian uh, motorcycle with the sidecar? Did, did it stay in your family or? No, no, they uh, they was department department kept them. I think there's only yeah, they went two to the state auction. Oh, because they, they must be worth a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to have one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my grandfather when he had his, he came in the brakes like going on at lunch, and he ran into the garage and broke his leg, so he was out of, out of work. But. I kind of followed in his footsteps. We, we, he wrecked a lot of materials and so did I. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I tell my wildlife story? Yeah. Because John never thought I'd get off the pavement, but, or I would get lost. Now listen to this, he never gets off the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I get called to an accident one day down in South China. And uh, when I got there, there was nobody around, but there was a vehicle off the road upside down on its roof. So a couple things you're going to do real quick. You want to call for a record and get the vehicle back over. And then you do a perimeter search around to make sure somebody wasn't thrown from the vehicle and they're laying injured or, or dead in the woods. And the record came and flipped it over and there was nobody under it. So that's all good. So I ran the license plate and found out that the residence was just in the next town over, over in East Fassenburg. So I go over and I find the house and, and it was a beautiful home out in the country. And I go to the door and knock and this uh, lady, um, middle-aged lady, very pleasant, and I told her who I was and why I was there, and she goes, yeah, she goes, we've been expecting you. It was our teenage son who just got his license and wrecked the car, and he's, he's here now. I said, great. I said, I need to talk to him, and you know, be good that you're here with him. So she invites me in, and we're at the kitchen, and they had this you know, beautiful home. They had this island in the kitchen, and they had this beautiful golden retriever dog that was very friendly. He stayed right at my side, and I would pet him off it, but he stayed right against my leg, nice and warm. And the father brought the teenage son out and we're, uh, uh, so I could talk to him and, and the boy explains to me what happened with the vehicle and how he crashed and came home. Well, I talked to this boy for a good 15 minutes and uh, when it was all done, obviously he, there was a couple of violations that he had committed while he did this and I had to write him a summons and I told the parents, I said, this is what's going to have to happen. They said, no. No problem, we, we completely understand this will be a good lesson for him and so forth. And I said, okay. I got out my summons book and put it down on the island because the golden retrieve was still right here. It's a warm pattern. As soon as I put the name, his master's name, on that summons, that nice warm feeling on my legs started to feel really wet. I looked down and that dog was using me as a urinal right there in that kitchen. And I never saw blood drain out of two people's faces as those guys were. And they grabbed the towels and wiped me down and, and uh, apologizing and offering to pay for the laundry. And, and I said, no, I said, listen, I have a great sense of humor. Think of the story you get to tell after I leave. That's my mom. You know how long it took me to train that dog? You can only balance the dog. <laughs> hey, we want to thank you folks for having us. Thanks, Maggie, for having us.